I'm Carol Fitzgerald from readinggroupguides.com, a website from the Book Report Network, and the host of the Book Reporter Talks to video podcast series. I want to welcome you to Bookachino Live Book Group event, where our guest this evening is Allison Pataki, and we're going to be discussing her latest novel, The Magnificent Lives of Marjorie Post. Been lucky enough to interview Allison in the past, and our book reporter re reviewer, Amy Wyakowski, had this to say about The Magnificent Lives of Marjorie Post. The Magnificent Lives of Marjorie Post is such a wonderful book to curl up with. It's lavish, exciting, and sometimes heartbreaking. But Pataki brings you around each time, and you're eager to tag along for the ride that was Marjorie Post's life. I do agree. So let's go over the format for this evening's program. Uh, let me start by noting that we're assuming that everyone has read the book. There are going to be spoilers discussed tonight. So if you haven't read the book, like that was the fair game going in on this. I'll begin with a discussion with Allison, and then a couple of members of the audience are going to be joining us to ask their questions. And then we're going to take some in, you know, questions from the audience in the Q&A down below. So if you have Q&A, go down there, drop in your questions, and they're going to be shared only with the panelists. We're not going to look in the chat for questions. We're only going to be looking in the Q&A. But feel free to chat amongst yourselves as time goes on. So I'm going to see if Allison can turn on her camera. Allison, are you able to turn on your camera and join us? Fantastic. They always change the rules on this. Hi, every Allison. Hi, and I unmuted too. I hope that's allowed as well. That is allowed as well. You know, it's really funny. Sometimes I have to turn them on. This time it seems like I, I, Zoom changes the rules all the time. But Allison, it's so great to see you again. It's been like- Thanks for having me. A couple of years to see you live, right? We were we were just saying, yeah, you were one of the last people I saw in book world before COVID. And I was one of your last interviews in the studio before everything shut down in 2020. And then I think I talked to you about this book in between yes. on yes. Zoom. So we've yes, done, it's like, I feel like we've seen each other, but we really haven't been in person. And there's so many times that I have meetings with the staff and whatever, and I look and I say, Wait a second, this isn't in person. This is really the stuff. I'm still waiting so it can be in person at your dinner table. Oh, food involved. Oh, oh, oh you're, you're you make very... me so hungry on Facebook. <laughs> my food, my food pictures. I know my food pictures. I just want to like come to Thanksgiving at your house one year. You can come <laughs> to Easter and bring the girls. We'll do an Easter oh, in the backyard. How's that? Care, with little careful jelly beans. what you wish for. Careful what you wish for. <laughs> You know, I'm going to open with a question from Pam Gardow. She's a librarian in Altoona, Wisconsin, who's also involved with the Chippewa Valley Book Festival. And she said, what is there about Marjorie Post that made you want to write her story as a novel? And do you have a special connection to her story? Oh, my gosh. Such great questions. Okay, so there... There are so many things about her that really excited me and inspired me. And when I first learned who she was and that she wasn't Emily Post from the Manners books and she wasn't related to Kay Graham and the Washington Post, but that there was this other amazing iconic woman named Marjorie Merriweather Post, I first just learned the Post Food Empire, mm -hmm. which I have in my kitchen and I never knew her story. I never knew the CW Post Battle Creek, Michigan story. So, you know, bird's eye frozen foods, for example, and just what a fundamental seismic shift she and her family made in the American way of life and diet. That, uh, with that incredible wealth correlates into the fabulous homes, like building Mar-a-Lago, building Hillwood. And then with that, also her incredible time in Russia, collecting all of the treasure from the czars and the Romanovs and the four very juicy, salacious, dramatic for the time, mm -hmm. scandalous for the time, marriages and divorces. And so I just thought, man, this woman lived so much life. And especially in her time period too, I thought she's like the Forrest Gump of the 20th century where she was front row to all of these major moments we know about, friends with the presidents, entertaining the royals, and yet so few of us actually know the, the details of her life story. So I thought, that is a journey I want to go on. That is a journey I want to take readers on. Now, as to how I relate, 
I don't yet have Napoleon's jewelry or Marie Antoinette's, <laughs> you know, precious gems, the size of pieces of fruit, still working on that. But what I loved about her, and I would say it's sort of like an aspirational relating to her because I just really admired her. Mm -hmm. I, I, I often joke, I wish I had a bracelet that said, what would Marjorie do? Because you see her thrust into these very challenging moments, whether it's on a personal scale with the deterioration of her relationships or on a more global scale, like World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, the Cold War. And you just see Marjorie constantly rising to the occasion. And you see Marjorie coming to life in the most inspiring ways in moments when she can pour herself into causes that are larger than herself. And through it all, she lives with such a dignity and a decency. And so I really liked her. Um, you know, I've written about a lot of women. I've, I've fallen, you know, enamored with all of them in terms of their stories. But Marjorie was one that was unique for me in, in terms of just how much I admired her and liked her and respected her. And so it did feel special. Yeah. It's like you wanted to meet her. You would want to meet her. You would want to meet her. I want to sit down at your table and at her table. <laughs> Those are the two tables. I want to have a meal. <laughs> it's so funny. So you spent six years researching her. What did that include? What were you yeah. doing? Yep. Yeah, so, cause Marjorie was unique in that way too, in terms of the subject matters of my books, because her history is, is very recent history. Dina Merrill, her daughter, passed away while I was researching this book. People who are present in scenes in this novel of fiction that I've written are still alive and are attending my book events and reading my book. And so that was a whole other added level of pressure mm -hmm. and also accessibility. The book immediately prior had been Desiree and there 300 years ago, there are gaping holes in the historical record. So this just, it had more available, you know, her home Hillwood is a museum. There is an entire staff of archivists and scholars who. I think you froze there it's available. Right. And so um, that made it so that there was so much available. So for me, I would say the most important pieces of the research were going to the homes. So mm -hmm. starting at Hillwood and then Camp Topridge in the Adirondacks, I got to see Mar-a-Lago and, and, and Hillwood in particular just has so much of the historical record of her life so well preserved. So, and, and resources such as interviews, firsthand accounts of her family members. So I was able to really soak up a lot of the details that way. Oh, that sounds like fantastic. I mean, really. And you interviewed her grandchildren and great-grandchildren as well, correct? Yes. Yeah, so, and so there was her great-grandson, Dina Merrill's grandson, Cole, um, Stanley Rumbaugh and Dina Merrill's grandson. He's the family historian. So he sent like digitized home videos of Marjorie swimming with Dina Merrill as a baby in the pool at Mar-a-Lago with EF Hutton and just like incredible footage. And so when I knew he was reading the book and I knew he was coming to one of my launch events in New York city, I was sweating bullets. I was so nervous. So when I got his stamp of approval and he, he took the mic in the open mic part of the questions and said, you know, thank you for writing about Marjorie, my great grandmother. It's as you said, it was this outsized, it was this outlandish, and we're just so happy you're bringing her, you know, to a new audience. I was like, okay, the night is over. It doesn't, doesn't get better than that. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah no, incredible, incredible family. I can relax. Give me a glass of wine. I'm always exactly. okay. I'm really okay. Done. <laughs> you know, is that, it is that moment until you know that you do have their sign off and that everybody is really happy with what's going on. Yeah. When is Debbie Moore to join us? Debbie has been uh, with us a number of times for these events. Um, she, we're welcoming her back and she always has such great questions. So Debbie, thanks for joining us. I think you're in North Carolina or South Carolina right now. South Carolina right now. There you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> um, which is a lot warmer than where I normally live in Syracuse. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although spring, <laughs> spring is coming to New York. <laughs> yeah. Eventually. Yes. Um, oh, first of all, I want to say it's a pleasure to hear you speak and to meet you. I have read all your books and I especially love Cece and the Accidental Empress. Thank I you. fell in love with those two books. Um, but which leads to one of my questions, you know, you've written about women from 
all different eras, all different centuries, all different countries. Totally. What has drawn you to those women? If there's yeah. anything that draws you to all of them, what is it? It's funny when you put it like that, I don't have ADD in life. Like I'm not an all over the place person, but my books, you're so, I'm all over. I've probably given my agent whiplash. So it's funny. When I first started The Trader's Wife on Peggy Ship and Arnold, which is American Revolution history, that is local to where I live. So I live in the Hudson Valley. I am right across from West Point. I grew up just a stone's throw literally from the house where Benedict Arnold and Peggy Shippen lived when they were plotting to turn over West Point. So that just came about very personally. And when I was pitching it to Simon and Schuster, my editor for the first book, they said, you know, the American revolution is really not that sexy. It doesn't sell. You're not David McCullough. And I was like, I'm telling you, Martha Washington might not be sexy, but Peggy Shippen, John Andre, that is some good stuff. So I convinced them. The book came out. It it did well. Hamilton came out. The American Revolution obviously can sell now. And so the second that that book came out, the editor, we were out after the book launch and he was like, all right, so you've banged down the door. You've shown that the American Revolution can sell. Find your next woman from the American Revolution and let's make that your thing. And I was like, well, Cece, let me tell you about this Habsburg Empress in Austria before World War One. And it was like, zoop, a completely different century continent. Point being, I really followed the like breadcrumbs of each story in an entirely organic way. And what it comes down to is that I find a story where I think, how did I not know that? How do I not? I want to know more of that. Why do people not know more about Peggy Ship and Arnold or Empress Cece or Marjorie Merriweather Post or Desiree Clary? And it really becomes a compulsion. And I tell my husband, I've been bitten. I've been bitten. I know my next story. I have found my next subject. I've found my next book. And it's really just like an intuitive thing. And I have a list and I've got a backlog and I keep a word document of all the women I would love to get to at some point. But the story just really grips me in a very personal, organic way. Cece was through being Hungarian American, traveling back to Hungary and thinking, how do Americans not know more about this history? And so each one has been entirely organic. Marjorie was through a friend giving me a tip that I should visit Hillwood. And I just fell in love with Marjorie's story. So I have followed my career in, yeah, in a very intuitive sort of organic way. And fortunately, I've had a very flexible creative agent who has been willing to support me in that in historical fiction, children's books, and nonfiction. And I hope to just keep going. And I hope to just keep following my heart and my nose and finding these stories. Because like, as Carol said, I spent six years researching Marjorie. Hopefully I'll spend the rest of my life talking about it. I have to be really obsessed. And so that's how it works. Thank you. Um, I know that you worked one time as a journalist. Was it difficult for you to make the transition from nonfiction to fiction? And are there skills you learned as a journalist that help you when you write historical fiction? So it felt like the most natural transition to make because what actually was difficult was me making the transition into news. I felt like such a misfit in the industry because my first job writing live TV news for on camera, I was I was pulled aside by my boss and I, I was fresh out of being an English major at Yale. And I was told, you need to write shorter sentences. Anything that has a comma is already too long. You need to use less big words. You need to be more snarky. You need to be more cynical. And the goal here is to provoke outrage. I was told that in an editorial meeting. And I just thought I could get better at my job, but what would pay would be my soul. <laughs> and I, I would just be so, I was so unhappy and so stressed out all the time and writing copy that was like bullet, like quick, get in, get out. Someone's half listening. You need to write copy that they can sort of just absorb while they're cooking dinner. And, and it was a totally different type of writing than what I wanted to be doing. And I, when I would get assignments that would be longer form, like St. Patrick's Day, we just had, I got an assignment for the website where I got to just 
delve into for just a few hours into why we have the traditions for St. Patrick's Day that we have. And even I just so distinctly remember having a longer assignment where I got to look about history and write sentences. I just love that so much. And so when I was writing fiction on the side in my free time at nights or on weekends or on my vacations, that was what I really, really love to be doing. And the, the writing is so different if you're writing for news versus writing fiction for a novel. And so that was really what I felt more pulled towards and what was a better fit. So where the news has come in handy, that experience um, has been in the promotional side of the job. Mm -hmm. I'm comfortable in a news setting. I have friends who are still in the newsroom. I, I'm not stressed out by the live television experience because I worked there for years. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm glad I did it, but I'm really glad I got out and that I'm doing this now. <laughs> so am I. Uh, so Marjorie Post was, was such a powerful and intelligent woman when it came to most aspects of her life. But when it came to men and husbands, she seemed to make some very bad or at least disappointing choices. Mm -hmm. Did you gain any insight during your research about why that was the case? Debbie, you said it exactly how Marjorie herself would have said it. She said, in life, I was very lucky, but with men, I never had much luck. And a friend later in life asked her, um, a, a friend from her business life said, you know, Marjorie, you could run U.S. Steel. Why do you have so much trouble with your husbands? And she said, I don't know, ain't it hell? She <laughs> seemed to not even understand what had gone on. But where, where I sort of settled out on it was you can understand why as a young, adrift teenager who's just been shattered by her father's divorce um, and quick decision to marry Lila, you can understand how she was drawn to the Ed Close romance as quickly as she was. You know, nowadays it would be a summer romance and it would probably fizzle out, but this was the Edwardian period. And he truly did propose to her after four days. And so you watch it happening, you're thinking this isn't gonna end well, but you can see how as a naive, scared, sheltered teenager, it would have, she could have done the mental gymnastics to think that it was the right choice. You can see why that ends. And then Ned Hutton was really the love of her life. And mm -hmm. spoiler alert, you know, from everything I've talked about with the family and just everything I've read, she was heartbroken. He, he was unfaithful. And all of the family lore of him, of her sprinkling the dust on the floor to get the footprints and doing all of her sleuthing work to find out his infidelity, you know, she, she stayed with him until she could no longer deny it until she couldn't stay with him anymore. And then you see the attraction to Joe Davies and it's a completely different way of life. And it's this crazy time in the world where he's in the inner circle of FDR and they go to Russia and you can, you can see that. And then really he became, everyone said, you know, as he got older and, and sicker and more uncomfortable in his body, the temper and the rage and the jealousy really became issues she just could not get over. And then the Herb May thing. Um, Dina Merrill truly said, as is in the book, you mean you didn't know that he was gay? And they all just thought she knew and that he was a companion for later in life. She said, of course, I didn't know. I wouldn't have married him if I'd known. You mean you did? And you know, she was as she was blindsided by it. It was scandalous and it was shocking. And so each of the marriages ends in a very different way. And each of the marriages is very different in and of itself. Um, but you can sort of see how she goes from one to the other. And one of the things I loved about Marjorie was that she's, she never gave up on love. She never gave up on finding that partner and finding that happy ending. And we're rooting for her. Um, and as dramatic and devastating as each marriage's failure is, um, you always get the sense that she's going to be okay. She's strong enough. She's going to survive this. She's going to come out stronger on the other end. And she never gave up until the end of her life. She kept teasing her daughter. She was going to get married again. And I, I loved that about her. And then it could definitely be in the Magnificent Lives, another chapter. Like yeah, another chapter, right? I think right? husband number three had so much power at, they were both, like he had the power and when she came, he came back from Russia, the world had changed 
And yeah. she was still here and he was here. And I think when we when last my interview, we talked about this, like the power shifted and everybody was looking at her. And I also don't think that we realize how much Washington, like when you change administrations, the whole city changes. Exactly. And all of a sudden, who's in, who's out, who can no get work. in a restaurant, who can't. And I feel that that, that was what happened with him is he came back and he was nobody, you know? He was nobody. And he had been in Russia and now it's a cold war. And now Russia's not our ally. Russia is the enemy number one. And so he fell from grace and Marjorie with her dynamism and her flexibility, she adapted and she was gracious and she made friends with everyone. And so she was on the ascendancy as sort of this up and coming hostess in Washington. And she just started to really outshine him. And Mm -hmm. he, he resented that. Yeah, it was like she also had all the money. She also had all the money. So (laughs) that was hard for men. Yeah, it was a big deal. It was a big deal. Like he really did want, he really did have her put the yacht in his name so he could say it was his yacht. He had her put the house in his name. Uh, That was something that really they struggled with. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you as always for joining us. Yep, thank you. I'm going to share a question from Terry Kalil, who's from Detroit Lakes, Minnesota in the summer and Charleston, South Carolina in the winter. There's a smart person. Mm-hmm. She said, the book focuses so much of his attention on the excesses in Marjorie's life, the men, the home, the travels, the jewels, mm-hmm. the gossip, the acquisitions. The philanthropic and charitable works are mentioned to a lesser degree. Mm-hmm. Is that intentional or is less known about those works? So... I, there was so much actually to balance. Like I told my editor, I could write eight different books about Marjorie. Each could be fully, you know, three to 400 pages, a complete novel. That is just how much there is. And, and you're right. There was the lifestyle. There was the homes. I could, there were more homes than what I wrote about, but I was like, how many times can I ask the readers to go along on a home building or home renovation project. The, yeah, the entertainment, the marriages, the relationships, the daughters, um, the philanthropy. So the business side of things, the post empire. So it was, it was sort of just a dance to try to fit it all in while feeling like a narrative, but um, not feeling at times like it was getting bogged down as sort of an information unloading. Mm-hmm. And so- For me, the three pillars of her life were family, which I would include close friends in that, you know, the people she loved and cared for, the business, because that was what made it all possible, the post-empire, and service and philanthropy. And there would be times in Marjorie's life where she teetered more into excess and enjoying the fruits of her wealth. But I always got the sense when she was in this moment that there were these stirrings of restlessness and dissatisfaction because in her core, Marjorie knew that her wealth was as much a responsibility and a burden as it was a privilege and that it was meant to be used to serve others and to make the world a better place. And so where I actually felt like she was the most alive as a human was when she was serving in the moments like the Great Depression or World War II when she gives the sea cloud or turns um, Mar-a-Lago over as a convalescent home or um, when she opens the soup kitchens and in Hell's Kitchen in the Depression or in World War I when she funds the largest army hospital in France. And so I, I did try to hit all of those moments, not only because they were inspiring, but also because they were incredibly important to Marjorie and her soul and who she was. Mm-hmm. And so it was just a matter of weaving all the different threads, but philanthropy was certainly a huge central one of those. Did you feel like when you were writing there, there was a lot that made it onto the cutting room floor? Like you just, I have too much. I have too much. Yeah. I, I can't do any more on this. I've got to move. The, the story's got to move as well. And if- I had, I had to keep it moving. And like, for instance, I, I had only ever prior to Marjorie, I'd only ever written about women who had been married once. And they'd fallen in love and gotten married once. And yes, probably some of them would have gotten divorced had that been an option. But I was writing about women in eras where it wasn't an option. Um, But Marjorie, I had to have her fall in love four times. Mm -hmm. And I had to bring the reader along on that and then have it end four times. 
and still write about all the other stuff. And, you know, Marjorie was busy every day of her life and she lived for more than 80 years. And I start this book when she's four and starting with nothing. So, and I take it up to the end of her life. So, so yeah, I had to keep it moving. Like for instance, I would have loved to have dwelt for longer in the jazz age and the roaring twenties and Marjorie with EF Hutton, um, when they're really growing the company and that's when they acquire bird's eye. And that's when they are hanging out with F Scott Fitzgerald and possibly inspiring the great Gatsby. That's when she's building Mar-a-Lago. Um, I could have happily dwelt in just that decade for the whole book, but I, I knew I wanted to start in battle Creek and bring it up until the end. And so I had to, I had to move at the clip. I did. Wow. Did you, and, but as you were going along, was there ever a day where I wrote a whole page and like, eh, can't use that? Oh, I just wrote three pages. You know what? That's not going to work. Yes, and- certainly. But you got to write your way through the process. Like I'm the first time I'm writing it, I'm, I'm almost writing it so, to tell myself the story. And then the subsequent drafts become about editing and fine tuning and shaping so that I'm telling the story that I have in my head to the readers. Mm-hmm. Um, but you have to write your way through that to sort of see what works. Yeah. You don't get, you don't get there right away, folks. No, you don't no. get there right I, away. I'm a draft writer. I write so many drafts. No one wants to see my first draft. It's horrible. It's got to be honed and honed and fine-tuned. <laughs> that is so funny. Um, Sarah, I'm going to ask you to turn on your camera. This is Sarah Ferguson from Galesburg, Michigan. Um, she's got a question for you. You know, it's, it's funny that you say about, you know, that you throw out things or whatever. Just want a quick question before Sarah jumps in with hers. Do you keep all your manuscripts like in Rubbermaid buckets? Like of this was everything from this one. This was everything from that one. You know, I I always have several. It, it's not in buckets. It's on my computer. I always keep everything that I've taken out. Like I'll have a folder that's just about what I'm working on. And so every draft all the research, all the cuts, it's all in there. Yeah. All there, all there. But you don't do that print out and put it in the buckets. I think I saw Diane Chamberlain the other day. She's donating. Forget, um, I forget what school, school in New Jersey, I believe is the one that wants her, all her, uh, you know, work, all oh, the backward work of what she's done. It was so interesting to see that. Okay, wow. Sarah, I'm sorry. I'm taking your time. <laughs> Go ahead with your question. <laughs> No, hi. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so my mom grew up in Battle Creek, um, went to post elementary school, grew up in the post edition, um, remembers when um the football stadium was dedicated shortly after she graduated. So um we really both enjoyed reading the book and um just you know, no know, knowing street names and things. Um, my mom was just really impressed how it it really just felt like you know, you were there and everything, um, was true and real and, and, and described exactly how Battle Creek was, um, along that time. And I work in Battle Creek at at another cereal company. So, um, it also, um, touched close to home. So I guess my question was, um, in your research, did you find, um, did Marjorie speak publicly or talk a lot about her early years growing up, um, you know, poor and in Battle Creek, or did she kind of just leave that part of her life behind her once she became wealthy and influential and, and kind of left left the Midwest for the big city and overseas? Wow. Okay. Well, I have to just start, Sarah, by <laughs> saying thank you. Uh, that means so much to me to hear the insider <laughs> approval on Battle Creek. Thank <laughs> you. I have a really good friend who's from Battle Creek as well. Well, and she was sort of my like gut check to make sure that it passed the authenticity, but to hear that it passes you and what's your mother's name and Kathy's approval. Thank you. Please tell Kathy I I say thank you. Um, Marjorie was a proud, from what I've heard, you might hear differently as a Battle Creek, you know, born and raised native, but from what I've heard from the interviews and the firsthand accounts and primary sources was that she was a proud Battle Creek, Michigander her whole life and credited so much of just the formation of her character and her values to her Battle Creek upbringing. Like she, in in interviews, she loved to say, I can still smell that old glue that she used to close the early boxes of postum and grape nuts. And for her going out into the barn in the early days of the post company and working with her father, raking the wheat and packaging up the trucks were just like, formative moments for her. And 
um, people said no matter where she went, whether it was Mar-a-Lago or entertaining presidents, she always kept that salty down to earth Midwestern gal, you know, ethic and, mm -hmm. and just the way she operated in the world and treated others was totally a result of her upbringing. What I will say complicated her relationship with Battle Creek and what I know was a source of resentment among some Battle Creek natives, particularly it could be said some post employees who were based in Battle Creek was that it was colored for her when her father died that it that Battle Creek really became Lila's turf. And Marjorie was at that point living on the East Coast with her husband, raising her daughters in Manhattan. And she sort of seeded Battle Creek in some ways mm -hmm. once her father was gone because she didn't want to have further interaction with Lila because their, re their relationship was so acrimonious. And then there was the legal trouble between them over who was going to get the the control of the company. And she said, of mm -hmm. course it's hers because she's the only child of CW Post. And that had been the plan from the beginning. And so she almost, I think she kept Battle Creek always as part of who she was, but she didn't go back as often mm -hmm. except for the occasional board meeting. But then once Lila passed away, that's when you see her going back, dedicating the stadium, CW mm -hmm. Post Stadium, and really it was like a homecoming for her that she had waited mm -hmm. for a really long time to have because it was almost too painful for her to be there when it was Lila's town. Mm -hmm. So it's complicated. Um, I think she always loved it and it was, it was who she was and it was part of her. Um, but it wasn't without pain and trauma, mm -hmm. if that makes yeah. sense. What, what's your impression as a, battle? no, it's, it's funny that, you know, I never knew that the Lila Arboretum or the old Lila hospital was named after her. I mean, I'm many years gone, but I mean, maybe that would make Marjorie feel good that like, there's yeah. this whole Arboretum named after Lila. And I don't think anybody would be able to tell you today that that's where that came from. So, right. Yeah. And, and I thought it was Layla. And then my friend who's from Battle Creek told me, cause she was born at Lila hospital. Yep. <laughs> so yep. She was like, no, they say Lila in, um, <laughs> yep. in, in yep. Battle Creek. But like then, then when she was married to Ned and Ned was really growing the company mm -hmm. um, and they were acquiring other businesses and they acquired bird's eye and Hellman's and log cabin. Mm -hmm. They moved the headquarters to New York because that's where mm -hmm. a lot of these businesses were headquartered in the 1920s. And so there was, there was like mm -hmm. that tension, you know, when she went to back, back to Battle Creek, she saw streets and buildings and everything named after Lila yeah. and she didn't want to yep. be reminded right. of Lila. Well, thank so. you. We enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> and say hi to Kathy too. I will. <laughs> well, do you know, do the, remember we were both eating the grape nut cereal? Yes. <laughs> you're, yeah. going, you're eating that cow? I was like, yes. And did you drink postum? Did you drink I, I didn't drink postum? I have to confess, I didn't drink postum, but it was really funny because with the cereal for our meeting, I think I told you because you were actually on with our book group, the grape nuts was the part of the like she used it as the crust on the pie, and it was actually pretty good. It was really yes. good. Like yes. the sweetness helped. Yes. And do you know what I just actually recently discovered why it's called grape nuts? Is because when Dr. Kellogg served cereal at the San. It was apparently tasteless, flavorless, no good. So CW Post added grape sugar and to make it sweeter and to make it more popular. And that's why it's called grape nuts. We, I couldn't figure out there's no grapes. There's no nuts. The grapes was the grape sugar. The nuts was just the nutty, crunchy consistency. Nutty crunch. And it works. I have a bran muffin recipe and I was putting some of that in and I got really high marks, you know, yeah, that made up the recipe. Yeah. So I'm going to ask Lisa Hickman to join us. Lisa is actually part of our book reporter team, and she grew up in Michigan, and we were really excited to have her join us today. So Lisa, I think you just need to join me on your camera. Turn on your camera. Let me see. Can you? Yes. Yay. So Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi nice to meet you, Allison. Hi. Um, love. We love the book. So I am part of the Reads Book Club that almost a year ago, you were going to Zoom with us when your children got COVID. We all got COVID a year, exactly a year ago. Yep. <laughs> April 6th. <laughs> and I just want you to know there were 70 people in attendance that day that had your book in their hand and read the book that Thank loved you. it. Thank so you. we, it was, 
everybody really enjoyed it. But I grew up in Michigan, like Carol said. And um, when I was either in third or fourth grade, we toured um, post cereal. And I still remember the towers and the wheat fields. And it just, when I was reading the book, it just like I could picture being on the bus and going out there and um, touring it. And um, it was just, as I was reading the book, I was fascinated at the time of, during the times that she became um, kind of like, in charge of the company, but not be, being able to be a part of the board. Mm-hmm. How was she able to do business with all these men, but not be able to have a seat at the table? Yeah, it was so it, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty mind boggling now to read a century later and to see that when we're starting yeah. the book and she's a teenage bride and uh CW post had raised her to be proficient in business and to know the inner workings of the company. And he said, Mm -hmm. I'm going to raise my daughter to be just as comfortable, um, you know, talking about business as talking about hosting a dinner party. And yet it was just understood that it was going to be her husband who took the family seat at the table. And like, it was going to be um, Ed Close for a time that CW Post hoped would someday be the president of the company. And then uh, with the second husband, E.F. Hutton, same thing. He was the businessman. He took the seat at the table. And so it's not until the 1930s um, and the disastrous divorce with E.F. Hutton that Marjorie really says enough is enough and right. requests at the time Colby Chester, the head of the board, that she could have the family seat, you know, in E.F. Hutton's resignation. And immediately everyone agreed. You are eminently qualified. Absolutely. Yes. You almost wonder if she could have asked sooner, but it's a gradual evolution and a process Mm -hmm. for Marjorie and for women. And so Marjorie's arc right. really follows a lot of the, the women of the 20th century. Like you see at that time, it's the FDR administration. You see France, mm-hmm. the first female member of the president's cabinet. And you see Marjorie taking a bigger role in business, which was groundbreaking. She was the first woman on the board of this major corporation. And so it's a gradual evolution. Mm-hmm. I think a large part of it made sense because Joe Davies was not a businessman. He was um, an attorney and a politician. At that point, I think she'd grown in enough confidence. She'd been the one who'd made the right call on bird's eye and had really been managing these right. gates that were small businesses, you know, across the country. I think she felt ready to ask for it. And society and the makeup of the board were in a place where they were ready to conceive of it. And so thank God they did. And 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 she was, you know, she'd been the one who was schooled in the business since age four. So it was, it was the right thing, but it it took. It took a few years, took a few decades. Yeah, Mm -hmm. certainly. And it is amazing. And going back to the food, Postum was always in our cupboard. Really? (laughs) The house I grew up in. Did you drink it? And then my, uh, no, my father (laughs) drank it. I just assumed it was like coffee because it kind of smelled coffee-ish. And, um, but we, my husband's family is from the Pennsylvania area. And we, every Thanksgiving, we bake apricots that are topped with grape nuts. Oh, so, yeah. It always that's makes me think of home. <laughs> oh, that's so good. And Post MCW Post claimed was from his days working as a cowboy out on the plains, you know, in the West, they would just roast up whatever they could when they didn't have coffee. Right. Chicory or wheat. Right. And, mm-hmm. um, to be a coffee substitute. Yeah, it's a it's a fascinating story. And what was it? It was I think PBS does a series. I think it's PBS um, does a series on the food that made America. The History Did you Channel. Ever see that the episode? History Channel. The Is History it Channel. The History Channel. I loved How it. Close. I loved it. Okay, so the the story that they yeah. Yeah. gave was pretty close yeah. to that. Yeah. And I'm not allowed to say anything, and I'm not saying anything. But there might be another series coming and there might be somebody familiar talking about Marjorie on it. <laughs> Ooh, 
Oh. But oh. I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. Okay. Just remember, we I know like, nothing. Yeah. We no. know nothing, but we will be. We know nothing. Surprised. We hear. We hear. But nothing. I will let you know so. if, I, if and when I know something. <laughs> That's what most of the authors who I know. Yeah, so love thank you for anything with television. Thank you for said. writing the history of her. It was yeah. great. Yeah, thank you yeah. so much, thank Lisa. You. Thanks yeah. for joining us. It's good to see you twice in one day. I'm you lucky. too. <laughs> and I like your scarf. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. We work together. We don't. See I'm glad together. you're all better in your house, Allison. <laughs> thank you. I'm so sorry about that. That was such a bummer. Oh, that's here. you know that what? And yeah, that was the times. That that's what was that. happening then. So <laughs> yeah. Fun times. Fun times. Here we go. Here we go. Laura, I'm going to ask you to turn on your camera. <laughs> there we go. Here we go. Hello. Um, Laura Beth Weitner, Weitner, Weitner is joining us from Somerville, Summerfield, North Carolina. I'm trying to get all Hi. these things straight. <laughs> Laura and you Beth have Weitner. a special guest with you too, or did he Laura, run off? <laughs> he's right here. I'm sure he'll jump up in my lap in a minute. Marjorie was a dog lover. Scampy's a true character. Okay. I go. told you he would join. Um, I was just so excited to, first of all, to not hear that news. You just didn't tell us. So, um, <laughs> but also I just really loved the book. I'm so happy to meet you here. Thank what you. I want to know is for me, it's so hard not to pull out a, a full bag of frozen veggies out of my freezer without thinking about Marjorie Post now, because it really left a stamp on me to know that story. Um, after all the research, after all the writing, tell us what part of Marjorie has stuck with you the most. The thing that when you, when it happens, Marjorie's right there next to you. Anything surprise you like that? You just nailed it. You just said it. Every time I pull out a bag of like peas or drink a glass of orange juice in New York in March, or just have a fridge, which we all have. That's all because of Marjorie. And I never knew that. And I never realized just how fundamentally she changed the American diet and the American way of life. And it's, it's so true how it is in the book that she said, America's ready for this. And the business experts, the men, EF Hutton, they thought they really laughed her out of the conversation and said, you know, people don't want to have refrigerators. Restaurants don't want to serve food that's been refrigerated. Grocery stores don't want to have freezers. And Marjorie said, I'm telling you, the American woman is ready for this. The American household is ready for this. And she just stuck with it. And if they had bought Bird's Eye, Clarence Bird's Eye's company, when she said they would have gotten it for 10 million. It grew and grew and grew in success. And she just never gave up. And she just said, I want you to buy bird's eye. I want you to buy bird's eye. When they finally bought it years later, they had to spend 22 million for it. So she could have said, I told you so $12 million later, but she really just, she had that instinct about that. And it really was just a disruptive technology and a disruptive choice that she made. And so that is really my moment. Um, cereal, I think about that because- the Kellogg's were serving it at the San, but they had no interest in marketing it to the actual public. And it was CW Post who said, you can take this, you can take this beyond the San and sell this. And, and prior to that, breakfast had been a two hour long proposition. A woman had to wake up before sunset, sunrise and get the fire going and boil the kettle and make the eggs or the flapjacks. Cereal is an instant breakfast and, you know, just the way like I can serve my family frozen cauliflower or broccoli or, or peas. So that is really what I think about. And then also it doesn't affect me on a daily basis, but Mar-a-Lago is just a big part of our, our lexicon now. And I just, I didn't know that it was one woman who built that as her home. Um, and just the history of Palm beach, like when she started going there, it was an island with dirt roads and mosquitoes and no nightlife. And now it's this resort town. And she was really like a big part of make of putting it on the map. Um, and so that was kind of an interesting historical nugget to learn about as mm -hmm. well. Well, I just think she's amazing. And the fact that she, I think she really had her father's business sense. And I'm so glad that she listened, listened to her gut because I'm certainly happy to have my fridge and freezer. Don't know where know. we'd be without it. But, uh, and it's the perfect book to talk about for Women's History Month. So thank you both for having, for having.
this. We loved it. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much for being part of it. We're so glad to have you here. Absolutely. I'm going to ask Cindy to join us now. And Cindy's joining us from South Florida. Cindy's very smart. It's supposed to get cold here again tomorrow. I was like, really? Are you kidding? Mm. Snow, maybe? Like, really? Again? Snow? I didn't realize. Snow, I'll probably have more like you by than down by me. Oh. But um, yeah, we keep laughing. It's like, oh yeah, that's really good. It's going, mm-hmm. it's the lamb lamb or the, um, my kids always just joke me, is it a lamb lamb month or a lion lamb month? In like a lion, out like a lamb. Yeah. Like, oh. so, they, yeah. so it's very calm at the beginning. So we'll see what, how we end the month. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're almost there. Yeah. Cindy's joining us. So Cindy. nice to have you here. Hi, you guys. Yeah, I'm here in Miami. And um, I'll step on, I mean, I'll follow up what uh, Laura was talking about because I am just amazed at Mar-a-Lago, okay? Mm-hmm. I mean, the current state of it, mm-hmm. but to know the history, mm-hmm. um, the fact that it was used for a hospital, mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. what would she think mm-hmm. about the current state mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. Mar-a-Lago? Mm-hmm. Do you think, I mean, what would she think? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Marjorie's dream, as is in the book, was always to leave Mar-a-Lago as a winter White House, just like she left Camp Topridge to New York State and she left Hillwood. She wanted to leave it to the Smithsonian. It's now a private museum. She had like this great sense of wanting to, she knew she had built these iconic residences and wanted to leave them for the public and for the, you know, greater good to enjoy. So her daughters did not want to keep Mar-a-Lago. It was a huge tax burden and expense. And for one person to have the federal government ultimately could not keep it because it was a security risk with the airport flight plan. It was huge cost to maintain. And so it was sort of like lying in this limbo before and sort of like a state of like, um, it was empty and just kind of sitting there um, before Donald Trump took it over. So what was amazing to me um, was when I had the chance to visit, it was just a weekday in January, like the high winter season. I I didn't originally get there in March of 2020 as I was supposed to because it was COVID and the the whole plan was scuttled. So I went back after I'd written the book, but I had a chance to visit and I walked in and I just thought, you know, you walk in now and it's a club and there's a security Mm -hmm. guards and there's, well, there are many security guards. There's someone checking you in. The front room, which would have been her drawing room or her salon, is now sort of like a, a lobby reception area. You can walk through to the different rooms. You can eat out on the terrace. And I just, I had a moment. I was there with the Palm Beach Historical Society. So mm-hmm. I was not there in any political capacity. Mm-hmm. I gave the entire early part of my life un, unwillingly. I didn't have a say in it to politics. So I now feel as though I, I'm not by nature like a political person. So I don't feel the need to carry the family banner in terms of being a politician or or following in that line of work. So now I get to write historical fiction and and enjoy, you know, writing from the sp- safe space removed as a fiction writer. So I had this moment when I went to Mar-a-Lago where I was with the Palm Beach Historical Society and I walked in, I just tried to tune everything out in terms of like our modern debacle and what's going on and just thought, If I were, or not if I were, but just Marjorie coming home at the end of an evening in Palm Beach, walking in, in between husbands, so alone, maybe the daughters are out of town, walking in and just having this as her home. How it's, it's just, it's unlike anything you've seen as a personal residence, as is Camp Topridge and as is Hillwood. And just thinking she really broke the mold on this. And it really sort of like defies um, categorization as just a one woman private residence. So I can't speak for her. I wouldn't, I couldn't possibly know what she would think a hundred years later, you know, Mm -hmm. after she built it, she built it in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. Um, But what I would say is that Marjorie was a decent person and she was a humble person. She was an unassuming person, a modest person, 
a classy person. Mm -hmm. Um, she led with her actions and her integrity mm -hmm. and not big empty words. And so she, she seemingly in her time could get along with everyone. She got along with people on both sides of the political aisle. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was a different world. It was a different world. And she, yeah, she, I don't, I certainly don't think she could have imagined what <laughs> happened. No, like draw your own conclusion, mm -hmm. kind of. Mm -hmm. You know, I was I was very interested. Um, I did some stuff with Ukrainian children. Mm -hmm. um, your uh, charity, I don't know if you really want to talk about that now, but um, at least mention it, you know, with the yeah. Hungarian. Yeah. yeah. Hung I, I think that's really super altruistic. I don't know how you can do everything. Oh, thank you. Well, so I know it's my, it's my dad. Uh, thank you. Thank you for saying that. So one thing I will proudly say, you know, not about the politics, but about decency and dignity and treating others with integrity. I'm incredibly proud of, proud of my father who also can get along with people on every side and was very, you know, friendly with, uh, members of, of the post family. Um, he has been to Ukraine on, on multiple humanitarian trips this past year. He is, I can't even remember the numbers, but he's delivered like 200,000 pounds of, or 200,000 tons of relief aid. He's built homes in, for many Ukrainians. He's delivered heaters, food, medical supplies. Um, he's brought in a lot of other people who have started, who've gotten on board with the fundraising. So it's um, the Pataki Leadership Center um he's in constant touch with ukrainian you know officials in zelensky's office and he just hosted a bunch of ukrainian soldiers for the super bowl um as part of, the, of this initiative he's bridging between the nfl and the ukrainian football league to raise money um so he's doing incredible work it's the george pataki leadership center mm -hmm. um and if you go to the pataki leadership center website um, there is a specific tab for Ukrainian relief. Uh, right. yes, I'm seeing the chat. My father is George Pataki. He was governor of New York and we are from a border town in Hungary. That's on the right. border with Ukraine. That is one of the receiving centers for the Ukrainian refugees that are pouring across the border. So like our village where our family is and was, um, is housing. It, it is a major, um, receiving center for refugees and a major center for refugee aid. So um, places where we visited are now housing refugees and like places where we've gone to visit family uh, they're in the village. And so um, thank you for drawing a spotlight on that. And yes, it is um, the Pataki Leadership Center. Yes. Well, thank you for all the work you're doing with that. Oh, thank you. And I can't, thank you. I can't say your as your father, tell him for us. I will. The bigger you. The bigger <laughs> you. I told, I told my dad, um, you know, so he was a lawyer and then he was a governor and he was in politics for a lot of years. Um, and I said, you know, a lot of people say in life, we have three acts in our careers. And my dad was like, I think my third act is, is working for Ukraine and we're working for, you know, the, the refugees. And he, and he, he just feels incredibly, um, heartbroken and want, and wants to do something about it, which is again, going back to the point about philanthropy, I think how Marjorie was too, like you see something and you, you jump into the fray and you, you find the, the crisis as an opportunity to serve. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much for joining us, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. So this book has so much more to talk about. We're going to move on to an audience Q&A as Tom is getting set up for the audience Q&A. He's going to be our voice of God. He's our editorial director. And I have a question about another one of your books from Janet, who lives in New York City. And she said, I recently read your excellent and extremely me uh, moving memoir, Beauty in Broken Places. I'd like to know how Dave is doing. Did he retain 100% of his cognitive ability, and did he re, um, realize his dream of becoming an orthopedic surgeon? The book was beautifully and very honestly written. Oh, how I feel you. about that book. Oh, how yes. How That's that how book. we first connected, right? Yeah, we first connected. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you. He's doing great. He's doing bedtime with all three of my daughters, and my oldest, my seven year old, just told him that he's not as good at the English accents with Harry Potter. So hopefully he's doing okay. Um, but yes, he's doing wonderful. He's back to work. He is, he's working in medicine. Um, one thing I will say, he was really type A. He was like a very hard charging. 
I think the stroke kind of made him like a type B plus that, that would be the change I've noticed over time. He's a little more laid back. I think that's a dose of perspective and like priorities when you spend a year of your life fighting to come back to life. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it shifts. And I also think it's, we became parents as he was recovering from his stroke. Our first daughter was born. I think that also, um, but also I think just physiologically the stroke maybe had an impact too. So I would say he's a little more laid back, which is good and bad. You know, my, my mother, my mother-in-law, his mother is like, you know, careful what you wish for. Cause <laughs> in some ways he's more easygoing. I love the part that he was so excited about your second pregnancy because he missed the first one. And you're just there like, okay, I already went through this. Okay. Yeah. This is not an yeah, exciting no. moment. This exactly. is not a great moment. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And now we have three daughters yeah, and three daughters. he's the youngest of six boys. And so this is wild for him to now have three daughters. He's a girl dad. He's a girl dad. He's yeah. like, okay, what is he? He's got a shirt. Girl dad, girl dad. Yeah, totally. So Tom, what do you have for us? <laughs> okay. Yes, we have a lot of good questions. I gotta say, this has been a fabulous discussion and we've learned so much, but I now have a craving for cereal. So I, I, think, uh, I think I know what I'll be having for breakfast tomorrow. <laughs> All the cereal talk. <laughs> there you go. Either that or frozen peas. Right. Exactly. Well, cereal <laughs> is maybe a little bit more exciting for me. So. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> um, so Andrea asks, you said that you did research for six years for this wonderful book. How long did it take you to actually write it once you finished the research? Yeah. So I write in drafts. Um, so I started writing it in late tw- in 19. And then I, I specifically remember rushing to get it done. Like I was supposed to go to Mar-a-Lago for my last, you know, leg of research early in 2020. And it got, that got scuttled because of COVID. I very, very specifically remember looking at the calendar and thinking they are going to close my kids' schools and I am going to lose childcare and racing against the clock to finish it in early March of 2020. Um, but, th- but that was a draft. And then I edit for, months. And then I edit with my editor, Kara Caesar, who's wonderful. Um, and then I have copy editors. So it's hard to like say exactly, but usually I'm in the writing process with drafting and edits for about a year, I would say. Mm-hmm. Wow. It's a long time Carol, to be in a book. Yeah. 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 Carol okay. asks in, in the book, Marjorie was very generous with her resources. Was this mm-hmm. true in real life? Oh, yes. Marjorie said, I put it to work. And she said, my wealth would have been a burden on my soul had I not found ways to use it to help others. And she also said, wealth is as great a burden as it is a privilege. And so she, that's all true. There was actually more that I could have gone into, but everything that's in there, giving the sea cloud to the U.S. Navy, running the soup kitchen, funding the hospital in World War I, opening up Mar-a-Lago to be a rehab facility, all the events she held for the Red Cross and the Salvation Army, all true, all true. And there were, there were so many good deeds that she did that no one ever even knew she did because she, she didn't do them for credit. So, yeah. No. Susan asks, how involved was Marjorie with Post and General Foods? Yeah, so that was an ebb and flow thing. Um with Ed Close in the early years, in the teens and early 20s, CW Post was still alive. And so he was really running things, but he was trying to sort of apprentice Marjorie and Ed to someday take the reins with Ed being the real figurehead and Marjorie having to be more behind the scenes. And then with E.F. Hutton, I'd say she was more involved because they were really a dynamic partnership. And that was when you see her wanting to acquire more brands like Log Cabin and Hellman's and um, Bird's Eye, Maxwell House Coffee. So she was more involved then. And then in the 30s, she comes on the board. And so that's a totally new role for her in the leadership. Um, So she was. She Whether or not she was officially front and center at the board meetings, even in the moments when she wasn't, She was always involved behind the scenes. She was close with all the members of the board, the president, Colby Chester. They said wherever she went throughout the world, 
she always ordered post products when they were available. And she would do like on the spot taste tests and then write back to headquarters to say if she had like a subpar breakfast or her or meal. Um, she always served post products at her fanciest dinner parties. You'd see like the fanciest menu and then jello for dessert or like bird's eye vegetables. Um, and she brought all of her foods and products to Moscow with her when she was there in the thirties. So she was, she was very hands-on this. It was really, um, she called it daddy's business and it was, it was her baby as well. I love the part where she's bringing everything to Russia. Like, I'm and that's all true. It's mm -hmm. all going to get all packed. We're going to bring all these so we yep. can serve the Russians what we're going to eat. It was yeah. really wild. Absolutely and she wild. wanted to have vegetables and fruit because she was told she wouldn't be able to get them in Moscow in the winter. And she really did bring like tons of cold cream that was frozen cream as in dairy milk. But the press thought that it was face cream. And so they gave her a hard time that she brought that much cold cream for her face, but she brought it so she could make dairy products like desserts and milks and yogurts. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, Susan um, also says, I would like to know more about Marjorie's mother. What was her diagnosis? Was she really that ill or was she reacting to her husband's infidelity? Oh, great question. I think a bit of both. I've never seen an official diagnosis. I know she was always gone to St. Louis and Saratoga and other spa towns to get treatment. Um, I think part of it was what they called back then melancholy, which maybe would have been a mood disorder now. Um, and then she, uh, Marjorie maintained until the end of her life, of Marjorie's life, that what killed her mother was a broken heart. So I don't know the actual medical diagnosis, but I think it was a combination of being sick physically, but also um, being heartbroken by the marriage and the dissolution of the family. Mm -hmm. You think about so many things were undiagnosed for so exactly. many years. And exactly. now we have labels for everything. Yeah, exactly. labeled at age five. Whereas before it was like people went through all of life and you had no idea. They were just a little strange. They were just a little different. Right? Now it's yeah. Who you are. And, yeah. and even CW Post, we don't know precisely what was ailing him before he took his own life. Mm -hmm. They they say maybe stomach cancer, maybe appendicitis, maybe manic depressive. I've seen I've seen a few theories. Yeah. Wasn't running in for an a, a, a See a uh, yeah, PET scan and a CT scan. There's no such thing available. It was like, you might've just died and not even know what you died from. I know, I know, yeah. Or just um, like going to the sanitarium to take a rest cure. I would love to take, I would love to get a prescription for a rest cure. <laughs> I think it's in your future somewhere along the way when Hopefully. they go to college. There's Hopefully. a rest cure. You know? um, another uh, question about Marjorie's family. An anonymous uh, user asks, um, did Marjorie's girls have interesting lives as well, aside from Dina Merrill? They did. Great question. I've often wondered, is there a spin-off there? Like, should I write a book about Dina Merrill? Is that the next um, is that the next story? Because it's fascinating, fascinating life. And then Adelaide and Eleanor as well. Um, Adelaide became a great horsewoman and she raised thoroughbreds and dogs. Um, in the DC area and out in Maryland in horse country, Eleanor had a fascinating life. She married um, a musician, a composer and lived all across Europe. Um, and yeah, by all accounts, they were close and their children are still close. It sounds like a really, it's maintained like as a really tight knit family. Um, they all had multiple marriages, which is sort of like a consistent trait in the family. Um, and they're, they're all really still involved at Hillwood Marjorie's home in DC, which has uh, a fantastic collection of the art and the objects of art and the Russian treasure that she collected. She got um, for pennies so on the have... dollar. <laughs> We have a uh, pronunciation question here. Um, Stephanie says, in your research, uh, did you come across the correct pronunciation of Misner, the architect? 
I grew up in Palm Beach County and the locals would pronounce it with a long I, but in the audiobook it was pronounced with a short I. So I'm curious which way is correct. Great question. I always thought it was Misner. I thought it was Misner. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll have to check. Karen asks, have you Oops, I lost it. ever written about a woman you didn't Peggy like? Peggy Arnold. Um, Peggy Shippen Arnold, I would say you love to watch her do her thing, the intrigue and the plotting, but you don't want the American Revolution to fail. So you're not rooting for her. Um, so you love to watch her do her thing, but but I didn't, yeah, I, I don't know that I'd want to be friends with her. Cece at times really bothered me because I felt like she could have done more for her son. Sometimes I just wanted Cece to like toughen up a little, but, but again, back to Carol's point, we don't have diagnoses for what was the, she, you know, she was, she was not well. Um, so with the meat in her hair, she was the one with the, the meat in her, her hair. hair okay. Yeah, the, I the, always remember the meat in her hair. That's the one yeah. thing I remember she did. Obsessed with any grays she would find. Yeah. So she could be difficult. Um, but yeah, I would say Peggy. I would say Peggy is probably the most like love to hate her. Don't necessarily want to be her best friend. Okay. Oh, Jennifer Mendowitz is saying it's Meisner. Meisner. Oh, there you go. Okay. This is yeah. the reason you come to Bookachino Live. <laughs> uh huh. Exactly. Exactly. And um, Carol is a wonderful interviewer. Oh, well, yeah, but you're a fabulous agree, person yeah. to interview. You have good yeah. answers. <laughs> but I agree with that. <laughs> Um, it's a very interesting question from Patty. She says, uh, she asks, was it hard to decide on a cover? Uh, Marjorie was a diverse woman with such a full life. Right. Yeah. We wanted the cover to not be identifiable to one particular decade, but to sort of, you know, tap into the timelessness of her story that it, that she was a woman over many decades living this large life, the magnificent lives. What is an interesting story that I don't know many people know. We originally had different cover art and it was a different woman in a different dress. And I am in the genre of women in dresses looking away. That is like what every cover of historical fiction is these days, <laughs> women walking away. Um, there's a really funny social media video meme about that. Um, but we had a completely different dress and everyone had sort of settled on that. And then Lauren Willig, you know, Lauren Willig yes, yes. posted a cover from her backlist. Of, I don't even remember which book it was, but it was like over 10 years old. And I, I texted a picture of the cover. I saw it on Facebook. I texted a picture to Kara. I was like, isn't that our image? And it was her, Lauren's book was so old that the, the licensing rights yes. for the photo had come up again yes. and we'd seen it. And, but nobody knew that this book, but Lauren and I write in a genre and, and our work is close enough that we couldn't have two books with the same dress. So scrapped the, the entire cover concept, went back to the drawing board. And I'm so glad we did because I actually really love that we, the one we settled on. And Marjorie, one of her nicknames was Blue Eyes and she loved blue. And so I just think that the cover, I think the colors really work. So it was, it was good that it worked out that way. You know, it's funny. One year there was an Adriana Trajani book that came out and there was same, the same dress was on another cover. And I'm like, did, was the licensing, like, how did they handle this? And it is, that's that life cycle. It's 10 years old. The book is the cover, the, uh, the photo is able to be used again. Uh -huh. It's able to be used again for a book. And you don't really think about this when you're going into the process. And then sometimes it changes on the paperback. And it becomes something completely different. And you're like, wait a second, what's what, you know? Very and what was the other book that had the age? I can't remember, but I was like, does anybody, know? I can't remember. But at the time I remember walking in the office going, does anybody know that these two are wearing the same big white dress? And oh. it, I can't remember what, what book it was of hers, but I remember going, oh my gosh, this is not a good moment. No, good moment. oh my goodness. Tom, do you have any more for us? Uh, we do, yes. Um, so now we have a question about the title. Um, Nancy asks, why did you not use Merriweather in the title? Yeah, that was a great question. We had a lot of back and forth. And ultimately, the publisher felt like it was too long and mm -hmm. too much like a biography and too clunky. And the point was that people either know 
that's her middle name or they don't. And if they know it's her middle name, Marjorie Merriweather Post, they'll be able to identify who we're talking about. And if they don't know it's her middle name, they won't know and they won't care. And so it's better to have one, you know, one fewer word. So some some people have, yeah, have taken sort of like umbrage with the fact that her middle name wasn't there, but um, it was just, it was purely a function of what it came down to was they thought it was too long to add one more name. And they just um, said they felt strongly about keeping it as Marjorie Post. Well, Tom Donadio, who is our editorial director as well, will tell you that today I corrected it because he corrected me because it was the many lives of Marjorie. And he just sat there and goes, Carol, it's magnificent, not many. He catches me. <laughs> but you me got the time. idea. You but got I the make idea. them up. I make up these titles and it's title fusion. And then Tom corrects me, which is but great. But that's, Im- that's also the implicit, you know, yes, he yes. has many lives. It's plural. <laughs> many, right. you know, many magnificent, many magnificent lives. Exactly. <laughs> Um, just a comment from uh, Janet. She says, this cover is the most beautiful book cover that I have ever seen. Great. Oh. Yeah, let me pull this down. Thank you. It's really, it right it's really, there. really stunning. Oops, I got to do a yeah. There. It really is. Ooh, I am so grateful to the Random House team and the art team and the whole editorial team and publishing team. I, I tell them all the time, I'm the luckiest. I feel, I just feel so lucky that all of these people work to make this a book. Yeah, it's like unbelievable how much work goes into making this book. So lucky. Anything else? Um, Karen asks, "What has happened to all of Marjorie's jewelry?" Mm. Great question. Well, so the daughters got some, um, probably like choice pieces that were decided with Marjorie. The grandchildren got some, even like grandsons, great grandsons. Some of it went to um, the Smithsonian and some of his, if it is at Hillwood. Fun fact behind the scenes, when I went to Camp Topridge, her Adirondack estate, and I had the like amazing opportunity and experience and privilege to be able to stay overnight in her cabin at Topridge, there's a safe there that the family that owns Topridge now, the Crow family said, They've never been able to crack her open. So who knows what jewelry is in that safe? But it was surreal. Like her hairbrush is there. You still see her silver hairs in the brush. I was like thinking a security guard was going to have to come and escort me out. It was the most wild experience to stay in her cabin because it's largely how she left it. So I don't know what's in the safe. Knowing Marjorie and that she was a planner, I'm sure she got anything she needed to out of it. Um, But yeah, it went to the family and museums. Wow. I think we'll wrap it up with this question from Anna. Do you have a favorite book that you've written? This is my first book that I've read from you. So I'm so excited to read more. Oh, thank you. Um, it's like saying, it's like, like asking who your, who your favorite child is. Right? Was. Yeah, it's not the same. With I can't that. do that. And I have been told by some parents that they secretly do have favorites and they just would never tell. I can truly say as a parent, I don't have a favorite. I just don't feel that way. I really don't. So as a parent to my books, they're all different. Um, I don't have a favorite, but this one is unique to me in in what I said at the beginning, which is just how much I liked Marjorie and admired her and could respect her as a person. And also I liked that it was the 20th century. I thought that was really fun. It was recent. This is stuff we know it's relevant to us still. So, um, so I love that, but I don't know. I'm going to ask, I'm going to put that on Carol. What should she read next of mine? The queen's fortune or maybe CC or maybe just, Oh, I'm, I'm debating. I'm debating I, yeah. queen's fortune or, or CC. I don't know which one. I really I don't. just feel like I, I think as a writer, I do just learn more each time just yes. from working with my editor and working with readers and feedback. And so I just do feel like qualitatively maybe hopefully they get better as I go yeah so so that's why I'm like maybe just work your way back yeah, go backwards go backwards I would say go backwards yeah I think mean, that would totally totally work but for those who are still here you have a new book coming out next year and I saw this on Facebook with a teapot in the early hours of a morning because she is obviously has these three little girls and was up early yeah and it's called American Muse 
So whose life are you going to be sharing with us this time? Oh, I'm so excited. Margaret Fuller. She was this fascinating American woman um, in the 19th century. She was Nathaniel's Haw- Haw- Nathaniel Hawthorne's muse when he was writing Hester Prynne, The Scarlet Letter, because she was this like rebellious, sensual, free-spirited woman. But there, there was this click of geniuses, this genius cluster in Concord, Massachusetts in the 19th century. It was Nathaniel Hawthorne, Louisa May Alcott, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, um, Herman Melville, you name it. Like you read it in high school or college. They were living together in Concord, Massachusetts, falling in and out of love with each other, inspiring each other, competing with each other. And Ralph Waldo Emerson said that Margaret Fuller was the center of the wheel. And she real she was Louisa May Alcott's mentor. She was an incredible incredible woman. Like you cannot even believe the stuff she did in her life. Um, moved to Rome, took a Roman lover, fought in the Roman revolution, had a child out of wedlock, hence Nathaniel Hawthorne's, um, uh, heroine having a, a love child. Um, and, and so she really was incredible. And so it's American muse. It's the life of Margaret Fuller. And I'm obsessed. <laughs> obsessed. And when's the on sale date for that? Do you know? Next. That? So this time next year. So we're looking at February 13th of next year. Fantastic. Oh my mm-hmm. gosh. So what drew you to the story? Now, how did you find this one? Were you up in Concord, Massachusetts? I, I love trip? Concord, Massachusetts okay. so much. There's no place more beautiful than Concord in May, in the spring. Um, I have an aunt who lives in Concord, but... I read this book called American Bloomsbury, which was about this clique that was all living, like literally they were living in two houses right next to each other. Thoreau, Emerson, Alcott, Herman Melville, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Margaret Fuller. And she was living with Emerson while Emerson was married and they they weren't, well, you'll have to see what happens. But um, I just, I knew all of them I'd read all of them except her and she jumped off the page. And I was like, who is this woman? And I need to know more. And I became obsessed. And I was like, that's the book I need to write. I told you every time it's just an organic obsession. So when you're obsessed, like you're making dinner at night and you're thinking about this, it's like, you can't, I gotta go right. Like I'll jot it down on my phone or a piece of paper, or I'll run to my computer. It's like, it's like, I'm like a bucket and the water's spilling out and I got to like catch the water and And the girls are just looking like, why is mom looking like that right now? What is this thing that's in her head? Yeah. It's so, it's so like abstract to them because they see my books and I'm like, I write these, but they're like, but why aren't there pictures? And why are they so boring? (laughs) Like they don't understand quite yet. So, um, but they come to my book events sometimes, which is fun. I'm there's like, they, they know I write books, but they're still more into like, Illustrated. <laughs> illustrated. I know Cindy was going to ask this question before, and I, I think we just like you know kept moving. Do they like to read? Are they big readers? Do they? They're all three are big readers. Oh, they love to read. I mean, I read to them the second they're born. Like I'm reading to them in the hospital, then like on their first night of life. It's just something that's part of our DNA. Um, so my seven year old's obsessed with Harry Potter. We're in book five. Um, My four-year-old is just like a book eater. Like you could just give her a pile of books and put her in the playroom and she will just talk to herself and flip through them and starting to pick out words now. And then my two-year-old, we read every night and during the day and she knows her little books and she knows the character. She loves Spot. Um, She loves um, anything Sandra Boynton. So yeah, we're, we're just, we're a book family. Yeah, I packed up all the kids books. I like big boxes. Oh. And someday I'll become a grandparent and then I'll probably like here are all the books that your father read like when he was little. My little one didn't read. Um my little one's first report book report was about um what was it? Scooby Doo uh-huh. novelization or and it was like hor- like my older son was horrified. And he goes, "I can't figure out who the author is." And my older son goes, it's Hannah Barbera. It's a cartoon. Like, do you understand that you are not writing about anything? And he loved to be read to. And Mm -hmm. then it clicked. And in middle school, he read a book a day, like blah, blah, Uh blah, blah, blah. And then high school required reading, turned it off. And I am, I am not going to get on my little pony tonight, but I am so obsessed with not having required reading because I think it's such a turnoff to kids. Like just tell them to read. And I think 
I think now I've been out of high school many years and they're reading the same books that I read. Now there's such a thing as classics, but yes. there's also something that there are some books in the fifties and sixties that were really good. Uh -huh. And we might want to have them reading those instead of the same dead white guys that we read when we were in school. And I'm not being political or anything here. I'm just saying, yeah. Yeah. let's move ourselves a little bit ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And also whatever, like whatever inspires you to read, read that, you know, if there's just keep you reading, just keep you going. Keep reading. Honestly, yeah, yeah. Let them. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Thank you Amen. so much for joining us for Thank such you. a very special evening. I mean, everybody oh. looking in the comments, everybody had such a great time tonight. They really, really did. Oh. And we so appreciate you being a part of Book Reporter as much as you've been over these last years. I love you, Carol. I so appreciate you and all of the readers. And I'm just so thankful you are you are an icon. <laughs> oh, please. Everybody, I think I'm gonna just have to share who our next author is. Okay. You're gonna you're gonna know who it is anyway. You'll you'll know what she looks like. It's Kristen Hanna. And she is gonna be joining us to talk about the four wins. And we are extremely excited about this. She'll be joining us on April 26th, Wednesday, April 26th. I was out with Kristen yesterday. She's ex very excited about doing this with us. Um, so she will be here April 26th, eight o'clock in the evening. And we will be talking about the four wins. And so think about questions now. If you want to be on screen asking the questions, we'd love to have you be doing this. Registration for this event is going to be open tomorrow. Also, what we're going to do is um, something special is the if you want to ask your questions in advance, once again, do the same thing. Like what you've got to do is tell me um, what question you want to have, where you're from. If you don't want to ask the question, you're going to be shy on camera. It's OK. Just let me know what you want to do. So that's what we're going to be doing on April 26th. I am so excited to have her. Kristen and I have been friends for years. So having her be a part of one of these evenings is going to be so special. And also on Wednesday, April 12th at two o'clock in the afternoon, we are going to be hosting our one of our signature, you know, big uh, events that we do every month on the second Wednesday of the month. And it'll be Bookachino Live, where we will present books coming out the next four weeks. And we will be um, talking about some books that are coming out, let's see, April and June. And there's a lot coming up these next, you know, these next couple of um, months. And we'll be sharing that with you. Quick reminder that we're going to make this evening's talk available on our YouTube channel, Book Report Network, and on our podcast, Book Reporter Talks To next week, and we'll alert you when it's live. Anybody who signed up tonight is going to get a copy of the, um, the, the links to the video and the podcast. Feel free to share it with your friends, people in your book group. A reminder, we have more than 150 Book Reporter Talks To author interviews available on our YouTube channel, the Book Report Network, or wherever you listen to podcasts as Book Reporter Talks To. And there's a wide range of those. There's, um, we're actually going to be starting to talk tomorrow about um, a lot of the books are coming out in paperback this time of year, where we've already interviewed the author. If you're with your book club now, it's a new book to you. You know, you want to be able to do that. And stay on top of what we're doing, um, like these Bookachino live events and everything. Sign up for the Book Reporter newsletter, Reading Group Guides newsletter, so you'll never miss an event. Thank you so much for being part of the, our evening tonight. It was such a special night. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Allison as much as we did. And look forward to seeing you next month when Kristen is our guest. And start thinking about your questions now, everybody. I know that there are a lot of questions about the four wins. So to everyone, thank you so much. Have a great evening and see you next time.